laid this series on my heart. It wasn't just another series. Church, we're at a breaking point. Amen. I, I don't want to over-dramatize this, but I want us to understand where we're at. It's time to bring the glory back. God has instructed these words and these six sermons to be preached this hour, this time and this day for a reason. I know it's easy to look around. Well, so-and-so's not here. Well, so-and-so's not here. Well, the, the, you know what? I'm going to say this as lovingly and kindly as I know how. So what? So and so does not bring the glory of God. The glory of God comes in when we come in with a heart of praise. If we are here, the glory is here. And I believe that this series of sermons is going to change this church. Not because it's going to make this room holy. No, it's not how a church changes. Because the church is not a building. We talked about that in the first sermon. It's not the trappings that make the holiness. It's right here in our heart. We are the ones that carry the glory of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the ones that God has called to carry His presence. And I believe that this series of sermons, if we will grab a hold of it, if we will, will simply allow God to change our lives, <coughs> this series of sermons is going to change our heart. Amen. It's going to change the way we read the Bible. Amen. It's going to change the way we pray. It's going to change the way we worship. It's going to change the way we witness. It's going to change the way we talk. It's going to change the way we walk. It's going to change the way we interact with people on the streets. That's right. Amen. Because we're going to understand that the glory of God is back in the throne of our heart. Yes. But before we can ever get the glory back, we have to look at history and understand why we keep losing it. Last Sunday morning, I preached the first series, the first sermon in this series. Ichabod, where is the glory? And I talked about how that the glory of God had been stolen. And heartache filled the land. Last Sunday night, I preached God v. God. God versus God. Big G God versus little G God. And I talked about what happens when the glorious presence of God comes face to face with the imitations that we make gods in our lives. Right. And what happens every time those gods fall. Yes. This morning, I preached driving cows. And I talked about how the unholy Philistines said, we're tired of these tumors. And I ain't going to talk about the tumors again unless you were here this morning. <laughs> We're tired of these two. I won't tell you, you ever had a tumor. You're tired of it pretty good anyway. Uh, we're tired of these tumors. And we want to get rid of the presence of God. But we're not sure it was God. So they, they set up a test. It seemed almost impossible. But God came along and drove a couple of cows. Can I tell you, as we were singing a while ago, and we were singing that song, How Great Is Our God. And it says, come and sing with me. And we, I was singing. You know all I could think? I kept hearing, murr, murr. <laughs> Those cows were singing, How Great Is Our God. As they went lowly down the road. They were giving glory and honor to God. Tonight, we're going to pick up where we left off this morning. And I'm going to preach a sermon entitled, let me get to where I'm at. Entitled, Come Get This. 
Oh, now you see this title and people go, all right, let's go get the glory. Well, you might want me to preach at first. Because this sermon is one of the key sermons that God placed in my heart for this whole series. Well, pastor, if it's such an important sermon, why was it not on a Sunday morning? Because God said preach on Sunday night. If we, the Sunday night believers, can't get a hold of what it means to grab the glory of God, all we're trying to do is put on a show. I am sick and tired of churches putting on a show. I've been raised in this. I've been... I, 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 I was 12 years old before I knew everybody didn't speak in tongues. I thought every church ran the aisles and jumped the pews and rolled on the floor. I had invited a friend to come to church and he was like, Oh, you guys are weird. I'm like, what do you mean? Don't y'all do that in your church? <laughs> but can I tell you? seeing a generation of churches rise up and decide they'd rather put on a show than grab a hold of the power of Jesus Christ. I've seen churches, and we're going to talk about it in a few minutes, ask somebody to come get the glory and get it out of their house. And I've seen other churches that they wasn't that bold, but they decided... We don't know that we can live what it takes to be godly, so we'll just act like it. I've been in, mm, might as well buckle your seatbelts, folks, because I'm going to let it fly. Come on, go for it. I've been in churches that shouted and ran the aisles, but there was no more the power of God in that house than anything else. They were putting on a show. They were faking what they couldn't feel anymore. It's time we come to a place that we can't quit faking it and start living it. Mm. Let's read. 1 Samuel chapter 6, beginning in verse number 19. says this. But the Lord killed 70 men from Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord and the people mourned greatly because of what the Lord had done. Notice what that says. And the people mourned greatly because of what the Lord had done. Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord? This holy God, they cried out. Where can we send the ark from here? So they sent messengers to the people at Corinthia and told them the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come here and get it. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would send your power, send your anointing, send your peace, send your glory, and send your grace. Lord, I want you to direct every word that comes out of my mouth. Lord, I know the fire that you have placed in my heart as you have shared, as you have corrected, as you have guided and ministered to my life with this sermon. And Lord, I pray and I ask you to allow that fire to burn in each heart in this building. Lord, let everyone who hears this message, whether they be in this room or whether they be watching on video, Lord, let them understand that this is not the fire of a preacher. This is not the fire of a man. These are not the words of a mere human. But Lord, let them sense, experience, and taste the word and the fire of the Holy Spirit as it speaks forth in this service. Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Come get this. <coughs> what happens when we ask someone to take the glory? 
We talked this morning how the Philistines had faced tribulation. They called their priests and their diviners and they said, what are we going to do with this? We've got to get this out of here. And they, made, they, had, they had guilt offerings of five golden tumors and five golden rats and they, they put it in a cart and they put the ark in the cart and they took two cows that had recently given birth to calves and they separated their calves from them. And they said, make sure those cows have never been on a cart. And if they take it to Jerusalem, then we will know this was God. But if not, it was just a happenstance. It was just a coincidence. And we talked this morning how that God began to drive those cows. And they didn't veer from one side to another. They went straight back to Jerusalem. Seven mere months. Seven months after the ark had been stolen. Here come two little cows. Coming back into the land of Israel. Pulling the ark of God. Ooh, can you imagine? Now think about this. Remember back to last week? When the ark was stolen, the messenger came back and told Eli, the ark of God has been stolen. And when he told, was told that, he fell backwards and broke his neck and died. His daughter-in-law, her husband, and her brother-in-law had been killed in the battle in which the ark had been stolen. She was going into birth, in the labor. The midwife was calling to her because she was dying in labor. And the midwife said, it's a boy, you're going to have a son. And this woman spoke forth and said, name him Ichabod. Which means, where is the glory? And the Bible says she named him Ichabod. Where is the glory? Because the glory had departed from Israel. Think about what happened seven months before this event. The high priest has died. His sons have died. There's a baby walking, baby crying in the land now named Ichabod. Because the glory of God had left the nation. The nation went into mourning. What are we going to do now? And just seven months later, what's that? If you read, again, don't expect me to tell you everything. Get your Bible out and read it. But if you read this story, says that the people of Beth Shemesh were tending the fields. They were working. Did you say something, Fred? They looked around. You ever been out somewhere and heard a cow? Where's that at? Man, I'm a city boy. I go places I hear cows and They turn around and they look over and they go, Hey, here comes two cows down the road. They're pulling the car. It's gone. It's the ark of God. Ooh, what do you think happened? Party time. Church broke out. I mean, they had such a great service, the preacher didn't even preach. I'll get on that one later. They, I mean, it was shout down time. Woo! The ark of God is back! We don't have to wonder, we don't have to ask Ichabod anymore because we know where the glory is. It's right here! And oh man, they began to celebrate. They began to dance, they began to sing. They went and they took those cows and they sat, they took the cart, broke the cart apart. They set the ark on a rock, broke the cart apart, 
built an altar, sacrificed, and burned the cows on the altar as a sacrifice to God. Oh, we're going to have church now. Why is that important? Because how did they have church back then? They brought sacrifices. They had church. If it had been modern day, we would have started singing songs and dancing. Whoa. See, I told you I've been around Pentecostal church my whole life. I can do the Pentecostal two-step. It's the only kind of dancing I know. But they, they, they began to shout. Ooh, they had church. Man, that's a great, that's a great feeling. It's a great feeling to see the ark of God come back. We've experienced it. We've experienced it in this church. I'm so honored that they have Pastor Ryan and Jane here tonight and all day today. It, it, it's, it, it's an honor for me to have them set here. I know that I have the joy of pastoring a church that wouldn't exist without God, but in large part wouldn't exist without those two people. That's right. I, I remember coming down and visiting that little church <laughs> some 16, 17 years ago. And they were struggling. But they were excited. God's going to do something. You could feel it in the air. I, I, have, I have given Pastor Ryan so much appreciation over the years because he took a little thing that I did. And when I brought a missions team to this town, we, we didn't do nothing special. I mean, to this day, and, and, and maybe I need to ask Pastor Ryan, but I'm hoping that those bathrooms over there are not the ones we built. Because I, I'm ashamed if they are, that those are the ones that we that we worked on. But but probably made it worse, probably was Brian built after we finished. <laughs> really but but I, I remember, I remember us working, I slept in that church with 20 teenagers. And because that Pastor Ryan allowed God to move through his ministry in this church. My ministry, that my little thing that I did for a weekend looked like it was one of the greatest successful ministries in the world. I was like, I didn't do anything. But boy, I liked it. And now, 15 years later, I get to come back and be the pastor. I, I, it's exciting to me. But I'm going to tell you, Pastor Ryan can tell you, we've had times in this church that the glory's walked in. About a year ago, we started a revival. It was going to be one week, and it went 13 weeks by the time we was done. We, we know what it feels like to see the anointing flow through this life, through this altar. I've been there in my life when God has come in, and I feel His presence, and I feel His fire. I've danced down the aisles. I've felt the power of healing. I've felt the power of deliverance. I've seen people filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I've seen people grab a hold of the power that changes drug dealers into preachers and drug addicts into God followers. I've seen that. But unfortunately, I've seen it all go away. I've seen the same altars that once teemed with celebration and repentance and revival lay dormant and empty. And I say, why? Well, as you begin to follow their church service, everybody's having church. And there were 70 men. This isn't biblical, so you can't prove I'm wrong. I, I, I just got to believe that when they pulled that ark out on that rock, there was another chest there. And they opened up that other chest, and inside that chest, as we know from this morning, was five golden rats. That's what everybody wants for their man, right? A golden rat. <laughs> Needless to say, that was the nicest thing in that chest because there was also five golden tumors. 
And in case you want to miss it this morning, the tumors that are referenced in the Bible, when you would sit down, oh, they didn't feel good when you would sit down. The tumors that plagued the Philistines were hemorrhoids. And when their priests said, make golden tumors, they were making golden hemorrhoids. Can you imagine these 70 people that, I believe first they saw that, that cart and they opened it. There's five rats. And what are those? Hope they never figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you post that on Facebook, somebody's going to go, ooh. But I believe it started looking at what the Philistines said. But somewhere, they said, we saw what was in the chest. What's in the big chest? I'm not even got to my notes yet, so sit back and relax. But can I tell you that the enemy will see the chest? Yes, amen. And our curiosity will be so piqued to see what's in that chest. What did the world send us? What did we talk about last Sunday night? God versus God. We talked about the little G God of pride. We talked about the little G God of money. We talked about the little G God of religion. We talked about the little G God of all these other things. When we open that chest, we begin to see things. Oh, can I talk to the Pentecostal church for a second? Somewhere the glory came back, but there was a chest with it. And when we opened the little chest, you know what we saw? You can be accepted. You mean we don't have to be the weirdo church on the other side of the tracks? <coughs> we can be important? Yeah. You can be considered sophisticated. <laughs> really? Oh, come on. Those who have been around Pentecost for a while, we know, you know what I'm talking about. You remember the people talking about, well, that Pentecost is stuff, that's just for those weak people. That's for those strange ones. I am not strange. Okay, maybe I'm not a good example of that. But we begin to look into the little chest that the enemy sent us. And guess what? Ooh. That's pure gold. Maybe I could have some of that. And somewhere our curiosity says if I can get the gold out of the little chest, what can I get out of the big chest? They knew what was in there. Do not misunderstand the word. Every Israelite knew what was inside that ark. What was there? We talked about it last week. The stone tablets that the law was written on. A container of manna where God had provided for them. And Aaron's rod that had budded. We talked about it last week. We talked about how that God's direction or commandment was there with the tablets. God's provision was there with the manna. And God's uh, uh, direction and authority was there with Aaron's rod. They knew what was in there. They had been taught it all their life. But somewhere, I believe they started with the little test. They go, oh, this stuff is cool. I wonder what Aaron's rod looks like. Wouldn't you love to just hold Aaron's rod? Wouldn't you love to see the stone that has the law on it? You know, they tell me that the manna tasted like honey wafers. I wonder what it tastes like. See what they did. They began to look back and they said, our grandparents had something. And it's still in there. 
If we open this, we can see what our grandparents saw. Mm. I'm about to mess somebody up in this house. Your glory is not in what your grandparents saw. That's right. Your glory is not in what mom and daddy saw. Your glory is in what God has placed in your heart. If I try to live off grandma's glory, off grandpa's glory, my daddy is a man of God. But if I try to live off my daddy's glory, I'm going to die and go to hell. But if I let the glory of God live in me, 70 men let curiosity get to them, and they opened up the ark. And the Bible says that God killed them. They began to look and they found that there was a responsibility to having revival in the house. When the ark comes back, it's not a free-for-all, folks. I don't care. I don't care what you think you've always known. When the glory of God comes down in the house of God, when the glory of God fills your life, it's not time for a free-for-all. There is a responsibility that walks with the presence of God. And that responsibility is obedience. It had been taught to them generation upon generation, do not touch the ark. But somewhere, their curiosity overrided their obedience, and they thought, well, I'm good enough. Do you know we have a generation of people rising up in America right now saying we don't need to be obedient to the words of the Bible, to the words of the God Almighty, because we have arrived. I was once in a church that was having some problems. And I got up and I began to preach. And yes, I know I do some weird things. I have props. And I tell you this morning, I almost brought a cow. I almost, no, I didn't. But um, again, I'm a city boy. That's probably the reason I didn't bring a cow because I'm a city boy. But, but I, I, you know, I, I know we've had motorcycles in here. We've had boats. We do all, I do all kinds of weird stuff. But I think most people understand I'm still pretty much an old-fashioned preacher. And I got up in that church, I began to preach, and I had somebody come to me and say, Now, they didn't call me pastor, that was you pastor, they didn't call me back pastor. They called me which for in their case was a way not to respect a man of God. But anyway, they come and said, Now Tom, we don't need none of that speaking in tongues stuff around here. I said, Well, we're Church of God. We are the reformed church of God. I go reform yourself somewhere else. I need God's power. When we walk into the presence of God, there comes a responsibility to be obedient. Yes, I believe in grace. And yes, I understand. That works does not win our salvation. It is the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ because we deserve death because of the sin of Adam and Eve. But don't you miss this. When you walk into the presence of God, there is a responsibility to give yourself to Him. Yes. You have been bought with a great price. That means, that doesn't mean that you need to follow man-made rules. That means that God now owns you. That means that every decision you make is God's decision, not yours. That means that everything you do, you do in, 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 in con conversation, there's the word, conversation and meditation with the Holy Spirit and the Holy God and the Son that guides every step. And then you do what He tells you to do. Amen. Our mission in this church is to love God, live like Jesus, follow the Holy Spirit and serve the world. 
When we talk about following the Holy Spirit, that means that we understand that we have been put in subjection to the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit tells us to do is what we need to do. I said it once, I'll say it again. If the Holy Spirit tells me to stand on my head, I'm going to ask if I can lean my feet against the wall. Or are you going to do this miraculous? Because I don't know any other way I can do it. But I'm going to find a way to stand on my head. Why? Because it told me to. I don't need to understand it. I don't need to know why. I have a responsibility to be obedient. When God tells me to witness, I'm going to witness. When God tells me to pray for somebody, I'm going to pray for somebody. When God tells me to walk, I'm going to walk. When He tells me to run, I'm going to run. When He tells me to shout, I'm going to shout. When He tells me to shut up, I'm going to shut up. There is a responsibility that comes with the presence of God. Verse 19. Whew. I'm too fat to preach like this. <laughs> but the Lord killed 70 men from Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. And the people mourned greatly because of what the Lord had done. What are we mourning? When we bring sin into the house, God's going to convict it. Yes. You cannot walk in power and in sin at the same time. Amen. It doesn't work. That's right. And when God... Anthony, come here. Boy, you remember you're my boy right now. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit comes in and we walk in with sin, he grabs us and he says, Come here, boy. <laughs> I wish you had an old one on. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit, and sometimes the Holy Spirit will do that. He'll grab us by the neck of the neck. That ain't a good shirt. <laughs> and he says, hey, why aren't you listening to me? And we feel the correction of God. <laughs> we feel. It's hard to believe. I got up and I preached everything I knew about my scripture three times in five minutes. And I said, it's all I got, church. Y'all go pray. That was my fantastic altar call. And I got down in the altar. I wouldn't pray for nobody. And I said, God, I ain't doing that. I ain't preaching no more. I'm going tomorrow and I'm joining the Air Force and I'm out of here. And the Lord bent me over his knee and wore my hide out. I tell people when I tell the story, I felt like God literally slapped the back of my head. <clears throat> said, son, I told you to study to show yourself approved. Now you learn how to study and you learn how to let me do the work. And then God spoke to me. And said, get up and go two people down. And the first person ever to get saved in my ministry got saved in that disaster of a sermon. I, could, I left there celebrating the fact that God got me right. But there's been time after time after time that we've been spanked by the Holy Spirit. And we walk away from church going, well, I'm not going back there no more. I can't believe what God did to me. 
You know how many times as a pastor, Pastor Ryan, you know this, you know how many times as a pastor, I've heard, I can't believe God would do that to me. Well, I can't believe you would come into the presence of God and think that lifestyle is okay. I'm sick and tired of us coming in and being disobedient, disconcerting, disrespectful, and mourning God because He corrected us. It's time we start understanding we have a responsibility. And when we are disobedient, God's going to correct us. Amen. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says a man corrects his son. And if God doesn't correct you, you're not his son. Right. And I said it a whole lot nicer than the Bible says. Hebrews 12. <laughs> if God doesn't correct us, we're not his son. I pulled Anthony up here to use him for that illustration. He's my son. I have corrected him over the years. I have taken things away. I have given him whippings. I have grounded him. I have done whatever I could think of to do to teach him the right way. If I had never corrected him, he would not be my son. See, sometimes we forget that God's correction is God's love. What are we mourning? Are we mourning what God did? Are we mourning the disobedience? If we mourn the disobedience, we're going to have a different response. But too many churches today are mourning God's conviction. And so, mm, so we decided we will create a theology all our own. And we will talk of only about a God who only loves and who only gives and who only provides. And we start talking about an easy peasy grace. And we devalue the power of God's grace because we forget that the same God who loved us and cared for us enough to die on a cross for us is also the same God that will judge us and cause us to stand in judgment before him and give account for what we do. But because we have mourned God's conviction, we have begun to espouse, my God would never do that. Then your God is not your father. Amen. Your God may be a good friend, may be a cool dude, but I want a daddy. I want a daddy God. I want a daddy that when I get out of line, he's going to bend me over his knee and wake me up. What are we mourning? Verse 20. Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord? This holy God, they cried out. Where can we send the ark from here? What are we getting rid of? What are we getting rid of? Are we willing to get rid of the sin? Or are we, sell, are we satisfied to get rid of the glory? Either way, we get rid of the conviction. We can drive the presence of God out of our heart, out of our church, out of our city, out of our government, out of our world. And there will be no conviction. Or we can say, no, I'm going to drive the sin out. Lord, let change me, <coughs> not let me change you. You know what we've done? We have strived to create a God in our own image. Because we've been we've been raised in a generation. We've been and I know some of you, you're a little older than me, some of you are my generation. And it started with us. We've been it really it really got big with us, let me put it that way. We've been raised in a generation. I'm okay, you're okay. Live and let live. Tolerance is no longer 
people do their own thing. Tolerance now literally means no belief is better than another. Oprah has come into our society. Mm. Oprah has come into our, into our society and just about destroyed the church. Whatever God you can find to get you to where you need to be, baloney! There is only one way to Jesus Christ. There is only one way to the Father, and that is Jesus Christ. There is only one way to get to what is right, and that is to be obedient to the glory and the presence of God. But we have decided it's easier to get rid of the glory than it is to get rid of the sin. And I talked about it this morning with the Philistines. Now I'm going to talk about it with the church. Well, now, Pastor, it, it's just a few websites. It's not like I'm having an affair. Don't sit there and look sanctimonious to me. Statistics tell me that almost half the people in the hearing of my voice right now battle with unsavory websites weekly. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about in the church. But we've decided we don't want to talk about that in church because mm, that makes us nervous. No, we don't want to talk about it in church because it convicts us. Oh, pastor, I don't really need to pray every day. I don't need to read the Bible. That's what I got you for. That's why we pay you the big bucks. You know what they tell me? Tell me that most people, including praying over meals, pray less than three minutes a week. You want to know why there's no glory in the, in the altars? Because we don't know how to pray. We have decided we would rather get rid of the glory of God than get rid of the sin of laziness. I told you where you still told boots today. We would rather change God than change the way we live. Yeah, I'm going to say it. Why not? We would rather change churches than change our faith. That's right. That's right. We would rather say, well, that pastor will preach what I want. I'll go over here and let him preach what I want to hear. <coughs> we would rather change in our church of God, okay? We'd rather change pastors than change our sin. Bishop Brown, you need to get down here and get rid of this boy. He's preaching all kinds of hole in this junk. We're going to make us an old school church. We don't want none of that right here. We would rather send the glory of God out the door than change the sin in our life. You know what's happened? We've become so caught up in the pride and the and, and the the status of our position in the church that we won't even come to an altar and pray because somebody will think we backslid. Well, you know what? Call it what it is. If you backslid, get on your knees and get right with God. Don't send the glory out of my church because you don't want to get face of sin in your life. Mm. What are we getting rid of? The glory of the sin. So they sent messengers to the people of Kerethkir and told them the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Now if they started right there, man, they're having revival. Hey, we're having church. The ark of God is back in Israel. They didn't stop there. Come here and get it. We don't want it. The glory of God is coming back into this church. Every one of you can walk out that door for me. I want you to understand I'm speaking this in love. Okay? 
And I want you to hear me out. Nobody tune me out when I say what I'm about to say. But for all I care, every one of you can walk out that door. I'm staying with the glory. See, you're not going to change my life. The presence of God is. You're not going to meet my needs. The presence of God is. You're not going to save my family. The presence of God is. I, I don't care if you like it or you don't like it. I want to hold on to the presence of God. If mm, somebody needed to stand up and mess your mess and say, oh, no, 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 don't tell them to come get this. They come worship here with us. But I don't want the glory out of my sight. We have churches all across America that have decided that it's too much work to be obedient to the call and the power and the blessing of the presence of God. And they've said, in effect, somebody else can come get this because we're going to create a church. Where nothing I will say in any service will ever offend you or cause you any heartache of any kind. You know what? I don't want to go to a place like that. I'm not saying I want to be offended, but I want to be corrected. I want to hear the truth of the gospel. I want to grab a hold of a God that grabs a hold of me and says, You can be better. drives me crazy to see a, a movement come up within the church world. I know Pastor Ryan's probably been to them. I've been to them. Pastors conferences where they literally get up in Pentecostal pastors conferences and say, now, if you really want to grow, let the Holy Spirit move on Sunday night. But, but don't encourage it on Sunday morning. Because it might offend somebody. It'll make people not feel comfortable. Oh, I'm going to tell you the only thing offensive is if I get up there without the anointing and the unction of the Holy Spirit and try to speak anything. We have decided that we want the glory to leave. Come get this. Take it away. We don't want it. You know why the glory's not in the house? Because we don't want it. It's going to cost us something. We're going to have to change the way we live. We're going to have to change the way we walk. Oh, my. We're going to have to pay our time. Oh, there it goes. You know, all about money. No, it's not about money. It's about obedience. We're going to have to make a commitment to come to church. Oh, my word, we got to get up off our pew and sign up to work nursery and children's church and sing on the praise team. And once in a while, we got to go clean the sanctuary. God didn't call none of you to sit on a seat and be spoon-fed food. I figure if I'm going to let it out, I might as well let it all out. <laughs> Told Pastor Ryan, I said, by the end of this service, they're going to be voting you back in. <laughs> I'll tell you something. We have driven the glory of God out because we don't want to pay the price. We don't want it. We don't want it here. We don't trust it. Come get this. I can't trust the presence of God. The presence of God may, it may invade my private life. It may make me do something I don't want to do. You know, how, you know how many times people, well, Pastor, what if the Spirit makes me do something I don't want to do? Do it. Come on. You are not your own. Right. Can I just be honest with you? You ain't got a choice. That's right. That's right. You do what God tells you to do. That's right. Amen. But we've decided we don't trust it. You know why we don't trust it? Because we can't control it. That's it. 
So just get it on out of here. Because I like the way this church is operated because I'm in charge. Oh yeah, we may have a pastor, but I tell him what to do. And if he doesn't, mm, I just won't turn in my tithes yet. You know what? Oh, I thought, see, I keep coming back tired. I don't know why. Can I tell you something? You're not turning in your tithe check. It's going to affect me one iota. You're done. I'm gonna, can, can, can I be honest? I'm going to make somebody really mad now. <laughs> Praise God, I finally got to a place in my ministry where I got two people I can fire before it affects me. <laughs> Bradley went, oh, Lord. <laughs> We're not even going to talk about poor Angela. <laughs> oh, Lord. Ah. Can I tell you something? Now, that was a joke, but let me tell you the truth. I am God's man. God took care of me and provided for me when my pastoral salary was $200 a week twice a month. Figured that out. That's 100 bucks a week. And I'm not talking in 1960. I'm talking 18 months ago. And God still took care of me. I don't need you to provide for me because my provision is in the glory. So if you want to say, well, I just won't pay my time. You know what? You're not hurting me. You're hurting yourself. Amen. You're the one living in disobedience, not me. I pay my tithe every week. I, I, I'm obedient. God's going to take care of me. I'll tell you something. I use tithe because we can all grab a hold of it. But every avenue of life, obedience is the key. But we don't trust God enough. We don't trust God enough to understand. God's got this. We keep thinking we got to figure it out. I got to be in charge. I got to be in control. I got to fix this. No. Let the presence of God fix it. We don't trust Him. Come get this. We don't need it. We don't need this. Well, Pastor, I don't need to run the aisles and shout and speak in tongues to have to make it to heaven. You're right, you don't. But why in the world would you want to live in this life without all the power you have? I've come by here to tell you God has sent His glory into this house. And He's come here to meet your needs. We talked about it this morning. Pastor's prayer every week. Help me, brother. I'm preaching and my names are gone. Teresa's gone. Neva. Neva, thank you. Neva. Every time she's here, she's been up here. Found out she had cancer the day before her son's funeral. Was not even able to go to her own son's funeral who died of cancer. But she's walked this walk. I believe this. She was here when Mike would come up. God's got this, Pastor. She, she understood. We don't know why, but Mike went there. Now Neva's facing the battle. Every week she comes to this altar. And this last week, Test come back. Lip nose are fine. <laughs> the cancer that was a 9.2 is now a 4. God is healing. I met her in the aisle this morning. She says, Oh, I got a testimony, Pastor. <laughs> Saw Teresa. And Teresa said, God's got this. I'll tell you something. Why would you want to live without that kind of power? Amen. What did we say? I don't know. One of the services lately. 
The Lord Jesus said, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. One translation says, I have come that you can have um, um, a great life. And, 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 I can't remember it now. Anyway, come life and life to the full. You can be blessed and prosperous, a prosperous life. Why would we not want the best we can have? I, I've lived this life my entire life. People say, you ever miss the fact you didn't go, go out and sow your wild oats? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm telling I really, I am so sorry that my testimony is that I'm 44 years old. And, and, and NyQuil and one ice cream cone that had cherries that were soaked in brandy are the only alcohol I've ever had. I, I, thought, the, I thought the ice cream was cooked. It hit me about the time I took the first lick. Oh, they didn't cook nothing out of that. that that's the most alcohol I've ever had. I, I'm not... I'm not sorry that that's my testimony because I, I just got to be honest with you. I am not, I don't lay awake and I go, man, I wish I could have puked on myself and fell in a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> if I could have done that just one time, just, just puked on myself one time and fallen in a ditch, I, my life would be complete. No! Why? <laughs> Why do we send the glory of God out? I said, we don't need this here. You know what the people of Beth Shemesh said? In effect, we were doing fine before those stupid cows came across that line. Now, our sin has caused 70 people to be killed. We can't live up to that. Somebody come get this and take it away and let us just go back to farming. Can I tell you, there's churches all over this country, all over this state, all over this city, all over this room, that are saying, just let us go to church. Let us pay our bills. Let us feel goosebump once in a while. We don't need all that. We don't need responsibility. We don't need to be obedient. Let all that stuff go away. Just let us enjoy ourselves. Let us sit in our seat, park in our parking spot. To refer back to another sermon I preached several months ago, it ain't yours. It's not your seat, it's not your parking spot, it's not your church, it's not your choice. You have been bought with a price. We do need the presence of God. We need this. I want to invite you to join me in this altar. <laughs> And I want us to tell God 